was it for you, the actual process of doing the translations? Well, Bapa was, as everything he did, it was the way he led me into this was perfect because um, initially, um, well, in those days, Bapa used to still come down to the men's latihan twice a week. He would always, Thursday nights and Sunday mornings, he would come down, walk around in the men's latihan a bit, and then he would sit outside. And all the men, as they came out of that town, would all gather around. And uh, usually there was a sort of very dense group of people sitting around. And he would just chat. He would sometimes, it was about spiritual things, sometimes he would tell stories, sometimes he would just discuss what was in the papers, and politics, and football, whatever. Um, and then when it was Ramadan, of course, he'd do every, this every night. He would come there every night and sit in the old, outside the Latian Hall. And we would all sit around. I think it was only, only men, or maybe there were men and women in Ramadan. I don't remember. No, I think it was only men. We used to sit around till the early hours, usually till Saur. And of course, nobody understood what he was saying. And what happened was usually there were little groups formed around people like Prio. Prio would, was very kind, always used to translate for people. But you'd get snippets. And uh, some, one day Papa said, uh, by then I was fairly fluent in Indonesian, but I only could understand the part of what Papa was saying. Papa is much harder. I mean, you can be fluent in Indonesian and not understand very much of what Papa is saying, because he had a very, uh, he spoke an old Indonesian, which was heavily laced with Javanese, and one that's not at all common anymore. And also he has a much richer language and way of talking. So he suddenly said to me, uh, Sharif, I'd like you to translate. He occasionally, I wasn't the only one, he'd, he'd asked another Indonesian member to try and translate a couple of times. But anyway, he just said that, and, he, and I, of course, he must have seen I was petrified. But he said, "Don't worry, just whatever you remember, you know, don't if, whatever you understand, whatever you remember, don't don't translate anything you don't understand." So I said, "Okay." So that made me feel okay because it meant I, you know, a bit of translation was better than nothing, and I wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't have to deliver a perfect translation. So I, I did this. After three weeks of this, by the end of Ramadan, I was understanding nearly everything Baba was saying. You know, just the the effort of of trying to catch what he was saying had improved my comprehension that much, and I think I got better. And I was doing this. This was '69, so I was doing this for two years. I was the unofficial translator. Usman was the official translator, and I was the unofficial translator. So I would, when Papa had these informal meet gatherings or when he was talking about helpers meetings, usually at the helpers like yeah, every now and then. Then Papa would talk sometimes. Then he would give a proper talk, but only to the men. And I used to translate those. And it was very, uh, he somehow made it a non-stressful thing. So I... I felt I, I, I always felt I was able to do it a little better than what he expected, so I didn't feel any pressure. And that was the only way it could, if, if there had been any pressure, I would have just not been able to do it at all. And so little by little, I got the experience and the, the, the practice mm -hmm. in doing it. Um, and then, the very first time I translated a, 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 a proper talk sitting on stage and so on was in, Johannesburg, if I remember right, because we, I, again, I unofficially sort of accompanied Bapa on a trip in 1970, part of a trip around the world. But I wasn't, I was only there because I had, you know, I, I was free and I could do it. So, Hatati and I and our eldest son, who was then about nine, I think, we went around. And just one talk on the whole trip, he asked me to translate. Maybe Usman was tired or something, I don't know. But 
beginning it went okay. I, I felt I, I found I could cope. Mm -hmm. And then I wasn't asked to do a proper talk till the Congress. But in 71 Congress, he asked me to do all the talks. And that was my first real uh, experience of translating. Yeah. I guess people have a question about when you were doing the talks, were you like feeling the law behind or was it something that was more or less you're actually memorizing what he was saying and then saying it all at one time? Was <coughs> it's very hard to describe because unless you've done it, I think it's, it's I don't know if I can really convey anything, but it's like I found, I, and this is something I had to learn, you know, it's not Nobody told me how to do it, but I found that if I tried to understand what Bapa was saying and tried to remember it, that my mind would go completely blank and I couldn't, couldn't translate anything at all. I couldn't remember a thing. There was a sort of a certain state in which one was listening, paying attention, to everything Baba was saying, but not touching it, you know. <laughs> it's hard to, to explain, but like you just let it go in. It's not like you weren't paying attention. Because if you, my, if you started daydreaming, you, then you, you, you lost the thread. So you weren't, you, you weren't allowed to daydream, but you couldn't think about it or try to remember it. It's very strange. <laughs> and if one was in a, I found if I was in a clear state, I could go on like this for a, endlessly. I mean, I want to, he once talked for two hours. And because we just done, it was a helpers meeting, and because we just done the Latiha, and I felt very quiet, I was able to translate the whole thing consecutively. And it was like, like you're following a thread. You know? it, it sounds impossible, but I mean, if someone tells you an interesting story, you know, you can retell it. You don't remember each sentence, but you remember the thread. It's something like that, mm -hmm. but not quite like that. I think, I think probably it was a gift that was given to me for the purpose, because I don't have a particularly good memory. Um, um, but it somehow worked. But it wasn't easy. It was, I, I was always terrified before the talks, because it, it seemed like I, I didn't know how it worked, so therefore I, I didn't know, I couldn't do it, it wasn't me doing it. So I, always feel, I was always scared, you know, that it wouldn't work, yeah. forget everything. Yeah. It was uh, terrifying at first, I mean after 10 years or so I started to get used to it, so I wasn't scared, but for many years, I, you know, I, I, Really, you know, I had a cold sweat before the talk. It was tough. I think it's because the mind doesn't, under, you know, it's not the mind can't figure out how it, how it, how you do it. So it, it's kind of it's, you know, yeah. That would be scary, all right. Mm. Do you have any uh, stories or events or any things that happened to you while you were? doing this work or around Baba's house or just anything that you might want to share? Maybe things that Baba said or mm. things that had a particular meaning to you? There's some interesting things like <coughs> I notice well many I there are particular stories but they they can kind of emerge in response to to triggers which I, you know I don't know if I can anyone come to mind now but I noticed some things about Bapa that for example when he because I also, after that first trip, when I went with him as the official translator in 72, then I started also doing his correspondence. I would, uh, as well as doing my ordinary work, if we, two or three times a week, I'd go and work with him in the morning and I'd take all the correspondence and read him letters and he'd give me answers. 
Now, in the midst of those, he would sometimes break off and give a little talk. You know, he'd, you know how Bapa was, he'd suddenly, apropos of nothing, he would start to talk about some spiritual matter or something. And of course, sometimes these things related to what was in the letter, sometimes they related to things that were going on or something that I needed to be aware of. But I also noticed that when he was about due to give a talk, sometimes even where the talk hadn't been scheduled, I mean, I would only know later that he was giving me a talk, he would be going over things privately that would later be part of the talk. It's almost as if he was receiving in advance, you know. So, for example, if he was going to give a talk on Sunday and we were working on letters on Saturday, there'd be so huge chunks of his talk. He would just sit and talk, you know, about something. And I got to know this, that after time, that a lot of this would come in the talk. And sometimes he explained things in more detail. You know, he would, he would explain something in very, very carefully. So it was very, very clear. But the next day in the talk, it would only be a very short passing reference. But as a result, I knew immediately what he was trying to say. And that's why it, sometimes for people who are now retranslating his talks, it must be sometimes a little strange that I sometimes translated in more detail than what Baba said. Uh -huh. Because it might be something that he had been talking about the day before. Hmm. Um, but, you know, it, it, it was, I realized that, you know, Bapa was prepared for his talks, you know. It's, it's not that he thought about them beforehand, but it's like, well, like you and I. I mean, I, I, you, you, I'm sure you've experienced this, Rahman, that before an important meeting or something, suddenly you, you think of something or you, something arises inside you which you suddenly realize, oh yeah, that's what I'm going to say in the meeting. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever had that success, yeah, I have. And I, I think that's, the, you know, Bapa was doing that on a more uh, subtle yeah. plane. Um, what else? Well, there are many things, but... Um, <laughs>